Well, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, on behalf of the University of Texas at Austin, on behalf of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law, welcome to our warm and sunny campus. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bobby Chesney. I'm the director of the Strauss Center, and I'm also a professor and associate dean at the School of Law. Uh, the Strauss Center, I want to mention something really briefly about it, because I think it's pertinent to what we're doing here. It's uh, UT's home for interdisciplinary research into international affairs. And although the words security and law are in the title, we really have a, a big tent approach to this. Um, the great thing about an interdisciplinary home for a campus of our size is it provides an opportunity for faculty who might not otherwise run into one another or collaborate very often, provides us with a chance and occasion a vehicle to interact with each other and cross the disciplinary boundaries that so often keep us from doing the, the more interesting work that today's international affairs really call for. Um, it's certainly my favorite part of the job to interact with people from other schools and departments. Jason Brownlee of government is one of the people I've most enjoyed getting to know in this role. And when he first mentioned to me uh, the, the project that he was then embarked upon, a, a book with, with Tarek and Andy about the Day of Spring, I, I thought, well, this is going to be a big deal. I have, I have tremendous faith in, in Jason. And from what I've seen in the manuscript, that faith is more than borne out. This is a really impressive accomplishment. You guys are making a tremendous comp, uh, contribution. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're here today in person to celebrate it with us. Now, I, I'd love to be the guy who could hold forth for a bit and frame the topic for us. But one of the parts of being director is knowing your own limitations. I'm not that guy. But fortunately, I know who that guy is. And it's one of my other favorite colleagues on this campus. Dr. Jeremy Surrey is the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs. And he holds appointments both in the School of Public Affairs and in the Department of History. And he's exactly the guy to frame a topic as important and sweeping as the Arab Spring. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my good friend, Jeremy Surrey. Welcome, everyone. Uh, oh, is on. Press the button. There we go. There we go. Welcome, everyone. I'm actually too loud even without this. Um, but Bobby's been far too kind. Uh, I want to thank the Strauss Center for putting on this, this event. And I want to thank all of you for coming. It's really wonderful to have a chance to talk about this. Is that a little too close? Give a little feedback? All right. Yeah. OK. Uh, so. I'm going to just talk for a couple of minutes as a historian about uh, some of the issues that I think the Arab Spring raises. And then I'm going to turn things over to the experts here. Uh, what, one of the things that's great about this volume is we have experts who really understand these issues, who are going to have the opportunity to uh, talk to us about them and bring new research uh, to these issues. Is that better? It's a lot better. Just hold it. So um, I wanted to bring up two topics or two uh, areas for us to begin talking about this morning. I'm sure these are issues that Jason and Andy and Tadek uh, and the other commentators uh, will have a lot to say about. Um, the first is the question about revolutions, or, or springs, as we might call them. Uh, as historians, uh, we find that there are what I would call patterns of spring among seasons of winter and despair in many parts of the world. Uh, there's the famous uh, springtime of peoples in Europe in 1848. Many consider uh, 1919 in the beginning of the Wilsonian era another spring of sorts. Uh, there is, of course, 1968 that some of us have been foolish enough to write about, and the springtime of student movements in 1968. And then, of course, what we lived through with the uh, Arab Spring. And we could point to many other examples. I actually have a much longer list here. And I think what's important for us today, as we begin to delve deeply into these issues that this important book covers, is to ask ourselves, what makes these moments possible? Why is it, at least in the terms of a historian, that moments of protest, moments of possibility, cluster? That you get long periods of apparent stasis, followed by short periods, often disappointing periods, of massive change in multiple societies. Societies that only in retrospect look like they should be experiencing these changes at the same time. It's only in retrospect. In fact, Alexis de Tocqueville put this very well. Every revolution, he said, speaking of the French Revolution, is inevitable only in its aftermath. It is in predicting 
that we have our greatest difficulties. It's unpredictable when a revolution, when a springtime, when an uprising occurs, but it's all too predictable after it happens. And there's a predictable pattern, and I'm sure this is something else that'll come up in the discussion today. Uh, Crane Brinton, writing almost 100 years ago, I think captured this and still one of the most important books that's been written on revolutions. It's Crane Brinton's wonderful book, Cycles of Revolution, where he talks about really three main phases. A phase of hope and possibility, and he writes uh, very presciently that the hope and possibility is often even more shared by those outside the revolution than those within it. Hope and possibility. A second period of mass energy and engagement when things begin to happen, when things begin to change, when institutions begin to crumble. And then a third period, a Thermidorian or reaction period, a period when it appears that these openings have now been closed, closed very quickly, and in the words of a recent song, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, this pattern, this pattern seems to recur. It's unpredictable when it begins, but it seems all too predictable as it occurs. One question for us today, or at least for me, and I imagine for many in the audience, will be to what extent did the Arab Spring fit this pattern? If it fit this pattern, why did it? And what do we learn in comparison to these other moments in other regions of the world. What is the comparative element to this story? And how does it relate to other experiences we've had like this historically? A second question I want to put on the table, and one I'm particularly interested to hear about, and I know our distinguished panel will have a lot to talk about, is the question of external powers and actors. There's an internal history. There's an external history as well. What role do external actors play? What role has the United States played here? What role has the United States played for good and for ill? To what extent were the expectations behind these revolutions inspired, encouraged, or at least somehow symbolically connected to the behavior of the United States in the region? What role did the Iraq war play? Uh, I don't think you can make a powerful argument that the Arab Spring was a result of the Iraq war. But it would seem to me it would be hard to talk about the Arab Spring without talking about the Iraq War. And what are the opportunities for outside powers when an event like this is occurring? One of the most difficult things for a policymaker to adjust to is a sense of fast moving events far from your own society, but in an area where you have a long time set of interests. So for the Bush and Obama administrations to understand what was happening in the Arab world, and then to figure out how to react to that was an enormous challenge. And this, returning to where I started, was not that different from 1848 or 1919 or 1968. When you read the archives of policy makers in societies at these times, you find they are trying to run to catch up rather than overseeing and making strategic judgments. The urge to react without knowledge is often an urge that leads policymakers in directions that do not produce positive policy choices in these moments. What are the ways in which we can understand the policy choices of the time? And what should policymakers have known? I think that's an important question for us. Not to criticize them for not knowing what one couldn't know in real time, but in ret retrospect, what do we wish they had known? What do we wish they had learned? What are the lessons, not simply to play Monday morning quarterback, but the lessons for effective policymaking, the next springtime of peoples, the next time this happens? Because, and this is my final point, the history of revolutions tells us one thing above all. Revolution, massive change, unpredictable mass movements are, in Tolstoy's terms, the stuff of human history. This will happen again. Not exactly in the same way, not exactly in the same places, but it will happen again. And we cannot be prepared to predict, but perhaps we can be prepared to better react. So with that said, I'm now going to turn things over to the people who really know the story here. Uh, three uh, distinguished scholars. Uh, two of whom are good friends of mine, one of whom I just had the chance to meet, who hopefully will become a good friend. Uh, we have uh, Jason Brownlee, uh, my distinguished colleague from the Department of Government. Uh, I see Jason frequently on uh, transatlantic flights. <laughs> we seem to see each other more there than at the university. This is the story of the academic world for us. Tarek Masood, uh, 
who's a, a distinguished professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, and, and I think I've met Tariq on four or five different uh, campuses. Uh, the first time here, though. I hope you'll be back, Tariq. And then uh, the person I've just met for the first time, uh, Andrew Reynolds, Andy Reynolds, who's a professor of political science, also with a distinguished publication record at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Welcome to campus. Uh, as you know, this book is done, and we get the first preview here. So I'm really excited to, uh, to hear what the panelists have to say. I'm going to turn it over to you, Jason. Okay. Um, I think I'll speak for a, a couple of minutes and then we'll turn it over. So thank you all for being here and I want to also thank uh, Jeremy and Bobby for those very warm uh, introductory remarks. The, we've been working on this book for several years. In fact, uh, many countries have written constitutions in less time than it's taken us to complete this book. Uh, so, uh, okay. So, uh, Here's what the, you have the program in front of you, but just to kind of give you a sense of where we're headed before, before the first coffee break, um, we're going to speak, the three of us, in the following order, Andy and then myself and then Tarek, laying out the overall structure and then the argument, the main arguments of the book. We anticipate that we'll probably get done uh, around, uh, around 10, um, at which point we can open up for question and answer, for the first round of question and answer. Then at 10.30, we'll have our coffee break, and we'll reconvene to hear from our discussants. And then we will have another opportunity for, for question and answer and conversation. So that's the way uh, things are headed. Look, um, we look forward to hearing your reactions to the book. And uh, I will turn it over now to Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, first, we should definitely, on, on behalf of all of us, thank uh, the Strauss Center and um, to, to Bobby Chesney uh, and all of you here at the University of Texas. And also, Jessica Mahoney. I'm sorry, that slipped my mind. Je I wanted to say thanks to Jessica Mahoney, who has brought this all together and been an outstanding coordinator of all logistics at all kinds of levels. It's, uh, it's my third trip to the University of Texas. Uh, I was part of the CCAPS project, which was also housed under Strauss on primarily sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so uh, I've always had a fabulous experience and working with Jason here has been, has been terrific. Um, we should also thank our discussants for joining us today. Uh, probably the first panel will be lots of praise and applause for the book and lovely introductions, and the second panel will take uh, an alternative route. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're very, very excited to have Melanie, Amani, and uh, Greg with us, who are really just the most uh, fabulous experts and uh, experienced discussants of politics in the Arab world. And that's going to be terrifically informing to us um, as we take this, this project forward, even after the book is published. Uh, we were hoping to have copies of the book here with you. Um, we have a front cover, uh, which is very nice. Um, and in fact, the book does exist, but it hasn't been printed or bound yet. Uh, we expect that that'll be available in February of next year. It turns out that the Arab Spring just kept on giving, and things kept on happening. And every time we thought our manuscript was closed, something very big happened, and we had to revisit. And um, it's an interesting experience of working on a project um, that you have to reform and rethink dramatically from almost month to month. Uh, and I think it's fabulous that Jeremy, Jeremy noted at the start uh, some of the historical perspectives about revolutions in the past. If anything, the great intensity of the Arab Spring, as it were, is that a lot of these momentous ebbs and flows have been compressed into a very short time period. And I know that's true in mid-19th century Europe and true to some extent in Eastern Central Europe as well. Um, but at the same time, we've seen such intense, wide swings of governments, of power, of optimism and pessimism in the region that trying to put a book together to give any sort of perspective was incredibly dif difficult. And certainly, we do not expect to offer you anything like a full perspective. That would take the next and future generations to look at what has happened and what is happening in the Arab world. We do feel that in the last six months, there's been almost a deep intake of breath. And there's a moment now where we can, if not 
pronounce upon outcomes, we can know a little bit more about trajectories of individual cases within the Arab world, within uh, the Middle East and North Africa. And we do feel as though we've reached a point where we're comfortable saying something. It's certainly not the last word, but it's one of the first words about this broad discussion about what happened and why it happened in the Arab world today. But certainly we're cognizant of the fact that um, it's going to take many, many years and decades and centuries even to understand fully the dynamics and how they played out and will play out in the region. We began this book in 2011. I have to tell you that I, um, and this seems to be a case of each speaker passing on um, credit uh, to the next person, um, but I also do not claim in any way to be an expert on the Arab world and the Middle East. Uh, I came to um, this region as somebody interested in democratic design, constitutions, institutional design, and especially the impact of elections and election systems on minority rights and the involvement of marginalized communities within a nation state. I, I was a sub-Saharan Africanist. I did my PhD many, many, many years ago on South Africa, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and then have worked more in West Africa and East Africa. But about 15 years ago, I began to be asked to go to newly democratizing countries to advise them on setting up elections and setting up election systems and constitutional rights and power sharing regimes. And so what that meant was that over the last decade, I became more and more involved in this new growth industry of discussions in the Middle East. And I had the good fortune of visiting uh, Lebanon and Jordan and Yemen um, before 2011. And then after 2011, was asked to go to Libya, to Egypt, um, was an advisor to the Syrian SNC um, outside of the country, um, and go to Yemen as well, where I returned from a few weeks ago. But not being an Arab world specialist, not versed in all that history and literature, I wanted to say something, but I needed people who knew the world and knew Islamic politics. And I asked a lot of my friends for the best people working in um, the Arab world and in Arab politics and Islamic politics. And Jason and Tarek's names came up uniformly. Um, it was like a, a star search. It was like American Idol for the Arab world. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so I, I contacted them both, and to their great credit, they immediately said yes. They had many, many things on their plates, books about the region, but we decided to try and collaborate and see what we could put together. And initially, we had big questions. It was, what has happened in the Arab world after the end of 2010, the spring of 2011. Why did it happen? And how was it happening? And to what extent would constitutions and institutions become the game definers of these new states? To what extent would the choice of institutions, the choice of political systems, the choice of democratic types become the thing that was the deciding factor between success and failure? As we'd seen, I think, in a number of other cases in the developing world, in Asia, in Africa, to some extent even in Latin America, that choices at a time of transition were heavily influential. And so Tarek, with his great institutional background, and Jason with a, a, an institutional but a much longer historical background as well, um, came to this project thinking that we might find something within that element of politics, the politics that I was particularly versed in. But as time wore on over the last two, three years, and we saw the ebb and flow of dynamic change on the streets of Cairo, in Tunis, in Sana'a, um, in Benghazi, in Tripoli, as we watched that happen, we realized that we had to rethink our parameters. And we had to take a step back and a deep breath and think about much more distal variables, much more deeply historically, culturally, sociologically rooted variables that might tell us more than the moment in time that was 2011 and 12. We're really interested to find out how much space there were for actors in the modern period to determine their futures, their state futures. How much were those proximate choices of revolutionaries, of student leaders, of political <laughs> actors, of military leaders, how much were they responsible for these trajectories of violence, stability, democracy, authoritarianism? Um, 
In effect, how much space was there for the student on the streets from the American University of Cairo with a, with a phone and a Facebook feed and Twitter to make a difference? Because there was a huge celebration of that moment at the time, both practically but also in academic spheres, of the social networking, the media outreach of newly energized and high-tech savvy activists. But we were a little bit... Not suspicious, but we want to take a step back and actually see to what effect those people really were able to have at the time. And we tend to forget, and one of the starting points of the book, and I'm really just introducing and setting up the book, and then um, Jason and Tarek will take you through the substantive details. But we seem to forget, or at least I do, that there were uprisings across almost every country of North Africa and the Middle East in 2010 and 11. People were on the streets protesting from Mauritania to Oman, from Sudan to Syria, in at least 18 countries. People died in at least 18 countries in different numbers on the streets, protesting jobs, unemployment, lack of education, fuel price hikes, food price hikes, their lack of ability to choose leaders and hold them accountable, the total disregard for the rule of law, the almost humiliation that people felt on daily life. They didn't have accountability or connection to elected officials, to their leaders. And there was clearly corruption and fraud imbued within much of the Arab world and the political systems. People were protesting almost everywhere. But only in four states did we see significant change enough to bring down a dictator or authoritarian leader. Only in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen did we see the dictators fall, the very top of the tree lopped off. And that really is the focus of much of our book. Jason will talk about the initial parameters and the cases across the region, but as we get into the story, we do begin to focus into those big, high-profile cases of Libya, Egypt, Yemen, and, and uh, Tunisia. In those four cases, only to date in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya have competitive elections been held after the dictator was toppled. Yemen has not got to that stage. And only in Tunisia and Egypt, only in two of the four, did newly elected governments inherit any form of state that they could use as a mechanism to uh, deliver their ideology or their views or their political um, attributes. Only in two countries of the 18 did we see a new ruling class take over the institutions and could do something with it because Libya really did not produce an elected government that had the capacity to do anything in much of the state. Libya is run, as you know, in small little tribal, village, communal areas by the power of the gun, largely by militias, not by the central state. And then from the 18, we come down to just one, Tunisia. And only in Tunisia have elections, at least in this short time period, become the central means for adjudicating who has power. Because as we know, Egypt has given up on having elections as the means to adjudicate who has power. So only in Tunisia, now we're down to one of the 18, have elections become the sine qua non, obviously not the over, overarching determinant of power, but a significant way of choosing leaders and holding them accountable and enacting government policy. So the tone for us has changed, and for all of us has changed so much over three years. The tone of optimism has moved much to pessimism throughout the region. Um, and all of us who have traveled to the region, and, and many of you I'm sure as well, would have seen that on the ground. And I think sometimes as social scientists we forget the narrative stories of individuals. But I remember um, the stand-up bass jazz player in Cairo, Haimet, who had been living on the streets of Tahrir basically for a year between April, March 2011, all the way through, a student activist who initially, when I met him first time in Cairo, was incredibly emboldened and, and, and just uh, joyous about the change and the fall of Mubarak. And a year later was incredibly depressed and was ready to trade in his double bass for a much larger gun, or a smaller gun, actually. Double bass is quite big. 
And those sad stories are replicated, I think, throughout Egypt, but all throughout the region. I remember in Sana'a, in Yemen, the election official that I met early on, actually, even before 2011, who was so hopeful that his country might, after many years of fragmentation, have a dispensation that really included everybody, that had free and fair elections, um, that included minorities and majorities and men and women. And he really felt change was coming. And it was an optimistic time. And again, those hopes have been dashed. In Libya, I was very fortunate to go to Benghazi in Tripoli in September of 2011 and met um, new parties, returning activists, exiles, uh, women's groups, student groups. My translator was a lecturer in the business school from Benghazi, and he'd been fighting on the front lines up until a few days before we, um, we started to meet with people. Gaddafi, at the time that I was there, was still on the run. Uh, we were told somewhere deep in Niger in sub-Saharan Africa, but it turned out he was about 45 minutes south of us. Um, and again, that optimism in Libya has been crushed, and I'll talk a tiny bit more about that in a second. And obviously Egypt, which all of you know um, perhaps m m better than most countries because of its high profile, that experiment with democracy was quarterized within, within a year, effectively, uh, or in, within a year and two years by the military. In effect, in effect to me, uh, Egypt was initially a dance between three partners. It was a dance between the military, between the student activists, the liberals, the Democrats, and the Islamists, and effectively the Muslim Brotherhood. And very quickly, that dance became a two-step between the military and the Brotherhood. And now the military has banished all others, and they dance alone to their own drummer. Yemen is so more fragile today than I think ever before, because it's effectively degenerated into a Congo-like situation of fragmented tribal ethnic groups across the country, really all competing for their own slice of a pie that is not really big enough to share out those slices of the pie. All the pressures in Yemen are spinning, at least from my perspective, to fragmentation, to polarization, um, and not to a stabilized democratic state. When I was in Sana'a a few weeks ago, um, the fighting between the Houthis and the central state was such that we were moved from the Constitutional Commission um, on a regular basis because of shelling in the streets. And when you're trying to write a constitution, but there are shells falling around you, that is never a good sign. And these things are so different over time. In Benghazi, Chris Stevens, the ambassador, took us to Martyr Square in Benghazi, where the revolution had started, and showed us a big poster sign of the Fantastic Four superheroes. And the Fantastic Four were David Cameron, the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, the President of France, and President Obama. And the fourth Fantastic Four was Susan Rice, the US ambassador to the United Nations of the time. I show my students this photograph, and I actually do have it here. We can pull it out. Um, and my students can't even recognize Susan Rice. But in Benghazi, in September of 2011, she was a folk hero. She was a cartoon crusader that had liberated the Libyans from their awful, shadowy nightmare of Gaddafi. 11 months later, Chris Stevens, the ambassador, was dead in his embassy, not half a mile away from that spot. Again, a massive change in attitudes, not universally shared by Libyans, but significantly that the Americas as the liberators very quickly now had become, to many people, the enemies. So why is this modern, why this modest harvest? We actually had an article in the Journal of Democracy that was initially titled, The Modest Harvest of the Arab Spring. That's what we're trying to explain in this book, and that's what Jason and Tarek will talk much more in detail, detail about after I finish speaking. We're trying to place the Arab Spring in context, as Jeremy said, to the transitions from authoritarianism that have happened in history, at least modern history, going back at least a couple of hundred years. We don't claim to have massive historical knowledge of all those cases, but we can look at Latin America and East and Central Europe and Western Europe in the 19th century and say, and Africa, and say, how does the Arab Spring fit into what we understood happened and learned from those periods of time around the world? And 
How does the Arab Spring fit into the canon of transition, transitology literature that exists? The Stepan, the Huntingtons, um, the Schmitter, the O'Donnells of this world, the discussions of how transitions from authoritarian rules have happened in the past, whether they were successful or not. How does the Arab Spring fit in to that broader discussion? And as I said right at the start, ultimately, we have found that to us, the more powerful explanatory variables are not the proximate variables of attributes and actions in 2010 and 11. We see a lot of molding in deeper history, in deeper state creation, in deeper manipulation of the state by authoritarian rulers over a decades long period. That doesn't say that the parameters for action are non-existent. That doesn't say, to me at least, that the ability of activists, of advocates to make change is irrelevant. What it says to me is that what we have found in our focus on these cases is that the parameters for their ability to make change is highly constrained and perhaps more constrained than almost any other case point in time and in place. That the movement of democracy, of institutions, that is connected to people on the streets is very constrained in the Arab world, almost uniformly. And we were trying to understand why that was the case. And some of you may know, probably not, but I've done a lot of work on election systems and I will always, nine out of time, 99 out of 100 times, talk about the importance of election system design, talk about the importance of executive design, presidential design, parliamentary design, how you set up the democratic system. In this case, I have become persuaded that those sort of choices are secondary choices in what impacts outcomes in the Arab world. Frankly, if one group is going to win elections, regardless of the system, or if elections are basically impotent and meaningless because that's not what delivers power, then your institutional design becomes a secondary or even a third level choice after bigger choices about the nature of the state. If you have a bad transition, you're going to choose bad institutions. That's what we've learned from history. If you have a poorly put together negotiation, discussion, transition, you're gonna choose and come up with bad institutions that are counterproductive to democratization. But conversely, in the case of Tunisia, if you have a relatively good transition, you get better institutions. And you have a nice inclusive election system in Tunisia that's actually led to apparently the alternation of government in the second election. But that election system was chosen by people at the table who needed to choose inclusive, compromising institutions anyway. So there's a chicken and egg issue. Was it the election system that was a useful tool? Or was it always going to be chosen, chosen by groups that came together in a balance and chose those institutions? So this morning, I think effectively Jason will take us through the first half of the book, the broad lens about transitions, how they happened here, and how they fit into this deeper literature. And then Tarek will take us through the second half, which largely focus on those periods of time after 2011, the power plays, the constitutional discussions, the Islamic insurgence into politics or movement into politics and their exclusion from politics across the state. So thank you. This mic is, is this, does this mic work? Okay. All right, so kind of as Andy previewed in his remarks, there are, I mean, you might say for those who were hoping for democratization to spread across the Middle East with the Arab Spring, there are kind of two different phases of disappointment. Uh, and I'm going to address the first phase of disappointment, and then Tarek will talk about the second. The first phase is that out of... 14 Arab authoritarian regimes that were vulnerable in 2011, only four rulers lost power in 2011 and then in Yemen in early 2012. And so only four out of 14. That's a big contrast with what happened in Eastern Europe in 1989, where six out of six autocrats lost power. And all six of those countries, getting to the second phase, all six of those countries 
became democracies within a few years. Then the second phase of, of disappointment for, for the Arab Spring was you know, what happened in Egypt, what happened in Libya and Yemen versus what happened in Tunisia. And I think as has probably been evident from the remarks so far, one thing that distinguishes our approach from what you would get in kind of non-academic, uh, very close journalistic coverage is we find the cases of continuity as informative and as instructive as the cases of change. And in fact, it is in contrast with all of the places where uprisings didn't happen that we are able to reach some judgments about the underlying structural factors that determined whether or not uprisings would succeed. So if we look around the region, um, six major cases. Of course, it begins in Tunisia in uh, December uh, 2010, uh, nearly four years ago. Egypt is next, followed by protests in, in Yemen, uh, Yemen and uh, Libya and Bahrain about the same time in mid-February, uh, and then uh, Syria, finally, in mid-March. And so that's kind of the spectrum of cases that we're looking at. And it leads to only four cases of significant change. We avoid the term regime change here because there's a compelling argument that one could say the regime in Egypt is military control, and that regime has been in place since 1952 and remains in place. But we do think that the removal, the involuntary of removal of a ruler outside of an assassination um, is significant in itself, and we call that authoritarian breakdown. Our four cases of authoritarian breakdown are on the left. We note kind of that Libya only had authoritarian breakdown because of foreign imposed regime change. And we'll come back to that. In the rest of the cases, including the two other cases in the right-hand column, Syria and Bahrain, that experienced uprisings, the ruler remained in power. The ruler survived. So that's the, even back in 2011, that was kind of the, the variance that we were concerned about and interested in explaining. And it didn't strike us that the predominant accounts that were circulating, which focused a lot on the actors on the scene. It didn't, um, that didn't satisfy us. That didn't seem to, to do the job in terms of explaining it. So here's our, here are our main questions for the first half of the book. Um, why did major uprisings occur in six of 14? And why did three Arab uprisings produce domestically driven leadership change? I'll just go ahead and say that when it comes to the first question, this is where Andy's remarks about human agency, activism, grit, audacity, play an amazing role. You had uprisings in very uh, unfavorable, I mean, to say the least, very unfavorable conditions, especially places like Syria and Bahrain. And yet, and, and those uprisings failed, but they did take place. And they suggested that there is definitely a non-structural um, human component to this that, that we say lies kind of outside of our structural framework. So we found out that we really don't, we can't point to one or two big variables that will explain whether or not an uprising will occur. That's up to activists in particular countries. But what we can say is once the activists take to the street, once you have major protests in multiple cities over multiple days, and that's what we define as an uprising, then if you want to understand whether that uprising is going to actually remove the autocrat or not, you can look at structural variables, variables that could have been identified before the protests began. And that's really what our hope is from the book, to provide a framework that, is, uh, that actually provides some, gives some foresight into the ways in which the boundaries of political action, contentious collective action, are shaped by looking at variables that could be found, uh, measured, and identified beforehand. So. Could you just explain, when you say major uprisings in major cities, just a little more about how you define that? Sure. OK, so if we opened the book by talking about a couple of other moments where people said there's an Arab Spring going on. One of them was in the late. Uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, um, especially after the end of the Cold War. You know, in 87, Tunisians contributed uh, 
through some protests, to the removal of a long ruling autocrat, Bourguiba. He was replaced by Ben Ali, of course. Uh, um, but there was a sense of hope of, of change being kind of in the works. There was the Palestinian Intifada in 1987. In uh, 1989, elections in Jordan were unusually free, uh, freer than normal. And you had a significant rise in civil society movements in Egypt and, and major protests across the region during the 1990-1991 Gulf War. Protests for us is not enough. A ruler kind of relaxing the rules while staying in office, uh, like the monarchs in Morocco and Jordan are doing, that's not enough. We, with this book, are trying to explain something that's really out of the ordinary. And so in that sense, we want to draw a line. You know, we can debate where to, you know, the cutoff point would be, but we want to separate the uprising that happened in Egypt in 2011 from the protests that happened in Algeria. And we found that if you look at the geographical scope of these other protests, if you look at their duration, that they're really just in another category, a more kind of typical category of protests under authoritarianism. You know, still uh, noteworthy in the sense that people are bold enough to, to go out and express dissent at, at some risk to themselves, but, but not kind of his, sort of historically unprecedented in, the way, in what we saw in Egypt in terms of a post-1952 uprising. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're getting at with uprisings, to separate them from other, other protests. OK, the, the book is called Pathways of, the subtitle is Pathways of Repression and Reform. Here's where I'm headed. We have these two different pathways. And I'm going to explain more about this and show you the, the figure again later on, which the countries were on these paths before the uprisings began. And that's what's different about from, that's what differentiates our book from some others on the market, is this identification of prior structural variables that then chart the course, set the trajectory for where the countries were headed, with the final outcomes being the difference between authoritarian breakdown and leadership change in three of the cases through domestic uprisings, or crackdown and leadership continuity. The prior answers, the big serious answers that we wanted to wrestle with, you know, one question that I always ask um, my students if they're writing a paper or working on a dissertation, who are you disagreeing with? Who is it? Who are, who are you in dialogue with? And the two main kind of initial answers that came out in the first wave of literature on the Arab Spring was it's either it's about the internet, it's about Facebook activism, or it's about the military. Both of these answers focus, they're very proximate. They focus on kind of immediate actors that were on the scene on different sides of, of the uprisings, really. Um, and one branch of this of the, this literature, the focus on the military, we found to be very useful. But we wanted to kind of pursue it and develop it in a way that we can go beyond just saying, you know, when the military turned on the dictator, the dictator lost power. When the military shot protesters, the dictator stayed in power. Going beyond something that is just very proximate to explaining why did the military turn on the dictator? or why did the military turn on the protesters? And could we have answered that question in 2010, or 2000, or 1990? So getting at kind of the, the structures of these militaries. And we find two variables that explain whether or not the coercive apparatus went against the ruler or went against the, the uprising. Wealth and loyalty, um, measured by looking at oil wealth and whether or not there was a prior hereditary succession. Now let me explain what we mean by these and why we should expect that they would have some type of causal impact on the behavior of the security forces in these states. Well, with respect to oil wealth, there's a tremendous literature called the Rentier State Literature that says that regimes that have significant oil wealth don't have to tax their populations, and in fact, they can often provide quite generous social safety nets to their citizens. That, at one level, can actually reduce the impetus for dissent to begin with by, by satisfying citizens. In addition to the effect that it has on citizens, though, oil wealth can help to keep the military 
wedded to the regime, kind of fused to the regime in a way that it sees its interests sinking or, or floating with the regime's ship. Related to this, in terms of the effect on the military, is how regimes might also fuse the security institutions to them um, in the absence of oil wealth. And this is through hereditary succession. We have a lot of literature in political science that talks about personalistic regimes, or drawing on Max Weber, sultanistic regimes. So extremely personal um, dictatorships. You think, think about like the Duvaliers in Haiti, or, um, or um, the Somoza dynasty in Nicaragua, um, or uh, Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. So just kind of like some of the worst <laughs> dictatorships ever. Uh, the thing about, and, and, and people go in an interesting direction when they talk about personalism. They often argue that extreme personalism weakens dictatorships. And normatively, we might be inclined to think so. Like, oh, they're so bad, eventually their regime will fall apart. No one will stick with them. They'll, everyone will abandon them. But that is, that's actually, you know, unfortunately, not been the case historically. The, the most personalistic of dictatorships have often lasted for quite some time. We go beyond saying just personalism matters to looking at the conditions in which the ruler, the, the incumbent ruler, came to power. And we find that if the incumbent ruler inherited power, basically inherited the regime, generally speaking from his father, but it could also, in some cases, it could be from another family member. If the ruler inherited the regime, that is a, a, a very uh, specific form of personalism in which the security forces have rallied around the incumbent when they could have taken power themselves, when the incumbent was, was actually at his weakest point. So consider, for example, Syria in 2000, when Bashar al-Assad succeeded Hafez. It's not only that the security forces stuck with Bashar then and didn't launch a coup. It's that they had been going along with the succession project for years prior. It was not a surprise when Bashar al-Assad took power in 2000. The, the regime had been very open about cultivating Assad's sons, first Basil, and then after he died in a car accident, um, Bashar. And so the succession project was all out in the open. The regime was, was tra basically transparent about it. The other elements of the regime had bought in. You can contrast that to Egypt. We'll never know whether or not Gamal Mubarak would have succeeded Hosni Mubarak uh, in, if history had gone a different way. But we do know that the regime, by contrast to Syria, was incredibly coy about the whole thing. They weren't out there you know, publicly setting up Gamal as the heir apparent the way the Assads had. And so there was a relationship between the security apparatus and the regime in Syria that was very different from Egypt. And it's that relationship that brought the repressive apparatus alongside the regime in a way that would, that would serve the regime and help it endure in 2011. So if we take these two variables, and here, recognize, we're, we're trying to get a lot of leverage out of a few <coughs> factors. So we recognize that you know, we were all living through 2011. It's very complex, lots of, lots of details. We're trying to cut through some of that complexity to get analytical purchase. So if you look at oil wealth, the countries sort out into two pretty clear categories with um, the oil poor countries of Syria, uh, Yemen, Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, and Morocco on the right, and the rest on the left. This is from Michael Ross's 2012 book. If we look at hereditary regimes, we obviously have the monarchies on the left, but we also have Syria versus the non-hereditary regimes. And then we can combine these two variables into a two by two to sort out how, um, how the uprisings went and whether we would see authoritarian breakdown. If you look in the top right corner, these are the oil poor regimes that, in which the ruler had not inherited power. In all three of those cases, you had successful uprisings that led to authoritarian breakdown. The, the story is more complicated in the other three cells. In the other three cells, you could have had uprisings. Libya had an uprising. Bottom left, Bahrain, hereditary oil-rich regime, had an uprising. Syria, of course, had an uprising. 
But in none of those cases did you have domestic success. You had success in Libya only through the deus ex, ex machina of a, of a NATO intervention, the no-fly zone. So now we get back to the, the pathways. The non-hereditary oil poor regimes, Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, are on the top path in which there is limited despotic power and the course of apparatus splits, meaning the military does not stand kind of 100% behind the ruler. And you get authoritarian breakdown and a leadership change. I'll, I'll leave it to Tarek to talk about what comes after that leadership change. And then by contrast, we have the, the repression pathway where a regime was either hereditary or oil rich or both. Extensive despotic power, the course of apparatus coheres and you have, you, instead of breakdown, you have a crackdown and leadership continuity. So this has uh, you know, difficult implications for us to, to digest, but, but certainly important ones, especially for activists who may be thinking about going on to, out onto the streets and, and protesting. Um, human agency can generate uprisings in a range of conditions, but it's pre-existing structures that'll determine to what extent such revolts will achieve their aims. And when it comes to transitions from authoritarianism to democracy, um, especially, which basically is only Tunisia, the, the low-hanging fruit have been picked. Um, we say that, you know, if democracy, and Tark will say more about this, if democracy does come in other cases, it will tend to be through more of an evolutionary than a revolutionary process. So basically, gradually over time, through the kinds of uh, socioeconomic change that authors such as Barrington Moore have addressed, building up a middle class, reducing economic inequality, kind of slowly reducing the, the sort of mutual insecurity between the regime and the people, uh, and then and basically becoming more like Tunisia over time. And I will close there and hand it to Tark. I've got to load up my slides. Or can, can you just talk? OK, is this working? Can you all hear me? All right, well, while uh, my research assistant is <laughs> <laughs> Loading up my slides, uh, let me just uh, thank Jason and uh, Andy for their, uh, uh, their comments uh, and thank uh, um, uh, Jeremy and, uh, and uh, our hosts at the Strauss Center for this really uh, extraordinary event. My first time at the Strauss Center was in 2011, April 2011. I actually gave a talk on uh, why, uh, you know, where Egypt's revolution was going. And I was really optimistic. Now I'm going to tell you why that version of me was an idiot, complete idiot. Um, if we can just get uh, my excellent. You got them? They're really fantastic slides. I really do hope you all have an opportunity to see them. Um, so um, basically, as you've seen, the first half of the book, we really think about why is it that in of the 14 countries that, that were vulnerable only, six feature uprisings, and then only in four of those do uprisings lead to regime breakdown. Uh, and now in this second half of the book, we're going to talk about those four cases, right? Uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, and think about their trajectory. So the first, the first question which Jason has already addressed is why did uprisings succeed in so few places? And it was this combination of uh, of uh, hereditary succession and access to oil wealth. And now we're going to look at this second question. Why has democracy failed to take root in those few countries that actually managed to overthrow their dictators, right? When we were watching the, the, the footage of the Arab Spring and we saw these people in Tahrir Square and in squares across the Middle East overthrowing their dictators, why didn't the movie end there with that moment of victory? Why has it instead 
proven to be so depressing. And to give you um, a sense of how depressing uh, the region is, what I did was uh, we plotted the, uh, um, the Freedom House score. So Freedom House is this institution in uh, uh, DC that uh, gets experts to rate countries on how free or how democratic they are, right? And so what we've done is we've plotted the Freedom House scores of various Arab countries over the last three years, or, or you know, to, from 2010 to 2012, 2013. So basically before the Arab Spring and after to see you know, what is the general trend in all of these countries? And as you can probably tell, only in two places does the line get better, does the line go up? Do countries move from having been pretty crummy in 2010 to being okay uh, today? One of them is Tunisia, which we've already, you know, hinted to you is a success case. The other is Libya, which to me is only an indication of how Pollyanna-ish the people who do the ratings for Freedom House are. <laughs> Eventually, that line is gonna, maybe it'll be, come down here. I mean, they have to generate a whole new scale to capture the catastrophe that is Libya. Okay, so um, so what's so so? Let me just situate now what we're gonna uh, what I'm gonna do in this part of the 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 t today's festivities. So what what Jason has talked about really is the first phase of of this process of the Arab Spring, which we call sort of the initiation of regime uh, breakdown. So you have uprisings in a bunch of places. Um, six places to be exact, and only in four of them do we have regime breakdown, right? And so in those places, we say a democratic transition was initiated, okay? Then we, the next question is, well, did you complete a democratic transition? Now, no, this completing of a democratic transition is a very particular kind of social science-y thing. And usually we don't talk about completed transitions. We talk about consolidated transitions. Consolidation is a long way off for us, right? We can't talk about democratic consolidation, which involves habituation, everybody accepting that democracy is the, the name of the game, uh, Sam Huntington had his famous two turnovers of power test. All of that, you know, we can't really detect within the limited time frame that we're analyzing. But we can identify whether a democratic transition has been completed. And by that, we follow a definition offered by Lintz and Stepan, which is basically you've completed a democratic transition when you've had a free and fair election that produces a government that actually has the capacity to govern the territory that it's been elected to govern. Okay, so there's two features of a completed transition, a free and fair election, and then you have to have a certain amount of stateness, a certain amount of capacity, so that that election actually means something, right? I mean, we could all have an election here for the presidency of the United States. It would not matter at all because we do not have capacity to govern that state. Okay, so you need these two things. And in, in, in uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, you actually had elections, okay? So those three countries actually fulfilled that first criterion of a completed transition. They actually had a free and fair election for a government. Yemen has not. To this day, Yemen has not had a free and fair election. Now, I know there's some Yemeni experts sitting in the audience who says, well, wait a minute, there was an election. The president, uh, Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi, was elected. Yes, he was elected in an election in which he was the only candidate. And by the way, who is this guy? He was Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former dictator's vice president, right? The parliament that exists in Yemen today was the parliament that was elected under Ali Abdullah Saleh. Okay, so there's a huge amount of continuity in that system. And so Yemen drops out. They are out of the running in the democratic transition completion sweepstakes. Okay, so then we have our three cases. Um, um, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, okay, all had elections. The argument we would make, though, is that in Libya, those elections were for a government that had absolute, was a government only in name, right, that actually had no capacity to govern that territory, and the fact is that the idea of the Libyan state is so contested and contingent that that election, I think, was a sideshow, and in fact, Libya's had two elections. They were a sideshow more than the main event. Um, and so how do we kind of capture this? Well, this is the World Bank's government effectiveness indicator, which we take as a kind of proxy for stateness, 
And we've plotted it over, uh, you know, from 1995 to around 2010. And what you see basically, number the, the salt, this thing doesn't have a laser. I keep thinking it does, but it doesn't. Um, at the top line represents Tunisia, right? So Tunisia, most effective government throughout this period, right? Even in the authoritarian period. There's something different about Tunisia. That's the spoiler of this talk. Uh, and then yeah, Libya is way at the bottom, right? Libya sucks, okay, in terms of its state capacity. Um, and so it should be no surprise to us that it was going to fail to complete a democratic transition by this minimal procedural definition of a completed democratic transition. Okay. So Libya drops out, and we only have Tunisia and Egypt. Okay? And let me just complicate this further, because some people will say to me, Masood, how can you say, how can you guys say that Egypt actually completed a democratic transition? I know that Tunisia did. Tunisia, October 2011, they have a, 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 an election for their constituent assembly, which also functions as their parliament. And since they have a pure parliamentary system, the government was selected from the par a majority coalition in the parliament. And that really ticks all the boxes of a completed transition. Egypt is much more complicated. Right? What happens in Egypt? In Egypt, January 2012, they complete their first democratic parliamentary election in which Islamists win a majority. Okay, but the military junta, which is which was occupying the executive at that stage when Mubarak left, the military took over. The military says, "We're not going to let you form the government." We will continue to form the government. So the Islamists say, okay, we're going to run for president. They run for president, okay? What does the military do once the Islamists win the presidency? The, the courts, really, dissolve the parliament. So you had an elected legislature and a military executive. Then there's an election. You have an elected executive, and the they dissolve the parliament, and the military says, we're the parliament. Okay, so at, even at, as of May or uh, June 2012, when you had your presidential election, you still didn't have a completed democratic transition technically because the military occupied the legislative authority. It's only in August 2012 when the president of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, makes a deal with the military to push them out, and Mohamed Morsi then constitutionally declares himself the legislature. Okay? So only in August of 2012 do you have an elected legislature and executive in one guy, Mohamed Morsi, the president of Egypt. So in the purely procedural sense, maybe Egypt fulfills the completed uh, democratic transition requirement, but it's not at all what we really mean, right? I mean, one guy being elected into these two. So already we can see Egypt is a hugely problematic case, and we're being really generous, right, when we code Egypt as a completely completed democratic transition. Okay. But we're going to do that regardless. And then our question is maintenance, right? You've got this democratic transition. Can you keep it? Can you hold on to it? You've gotten democratically elected government. And in the case of Egypt, uh, as we know, in Ju July 3rd, 2013, uh, Mohamed Morsi, the democratically elected president of Egypt, was overthrown in a military coup. And that leaves us only with Tunisia as having maintained its completed democratic transition. And so for the rest of our uh, time, I'm going to try to tell you what we, what we came to, why we, how we explain this difference between Egypt and Tunisia. Now, given that it was a military coup, the first thing that people are going to say to you is, well, obviously this is a function of the role of the military in these two different countries. This very handsome man is Habib Bourguiba, the founder of modern Tunisia, who um, uh, was a lawyer by uh, training. Uh, in contrast, the founder of, well, I wouldn't call him the founder of modern Egypt, but the founder of the modern Egyptian regime, uh, this guy, Gamal Abdel these are actually the four presidents of Egypt from 1952 to 1954, Mohammed Naguib, 1954 to 1970, Gamal Abdel Nasser, really the, the main 
guy, then uh, Anwar al-Sadat, then this beautiful man, Hosni Mubarak. All of them were military dictators. In contrast to Tunisia, right? So Tunisia, that authoritarian regime was not constituted by military men, whereas the Egyptian one was constituted by the military. And so people will naturally argue, and it has been argued a lot in the literature, that the answer for this different trajectory, the reason that Tunisia did not have a military coup and Egypt did, lies in the differing histories of their militaries, okay? And the differing stances of their militaries in those societies. And there's a huge amount of evidence for that proposition, okay? So this is a table that we pulled out of our book um, where we, we, we try to um, uh, operationalize this idea of the centrality of the military to these two polities. And Egypt, the military, just looks a lot more central, right? A lot more men under arms, okay? A lot more military spending as a share of GDP or even per capita. Um, and there's this uh, index put together by the Bonn International Center for Conversion called the Global Militarization Index. Where they look at things like military spending versus healthcare, number of men with guns versus number of doctors, all these really clever indicators of how uh, big the military is relative to the rest of your society. Egypt is 27th in the world. I mean, one of the only things in which Egypt breaks the top 30. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, Tunisia is in, actually in the bottom half of nations, uh, uh, 79. So just looking at this, you would say, oh, well, there's a lot to this idea that the Egyptian military is just more central in that society. And so it was almost inevitable that they would intervene to abrogate any move towards democracy. OK. Um, and this is a powerful argument that we're not going to be able to dismiss. The only thing I would say is that, and we talk about this in chapter four of the book, where we trace the kind of Rococo uh, uh, ebbs and flows and, and events in the transitions in all of these countries, is that the Egyptian military seemed fairly reluctant to intervene. Okay, so for example, I even give you a nice little YouTube clip where um, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, this is the man who actually was the Minister of Defense under Morsi, the, the architect of the coup, and now the man who rules Egypt. Um, uh, he is responding in this video, it's in, in May of 2013, responding to secularists and oppositionists who are calling for the military to intervene. And he basically says, look, you don't want us to intervene. Settle your differences with the Muslim Brotherhood government because if the army comes out onto the streets, it's over. Forget about it. Egypt for another 40 years. And then he has this re uh, thing where he says, um, which means the army's fired. You don't play with it and you don't play against it, right? So this, this idea, and I think there's all kinds of other evidence too, that the military, which I don't mean to redeem, I have no brief for the Egyptian military, believe me, but the Egyptian military uh, was not champing at the bit to get involved. Um, um, so, so, you know, you, you, we can dispute that. You can say, well, I agree with you, Masood, or no, in fact, I think that the military was champing at the bit to get involved. But that then opens a different question, right? And the different question is this, that, you know, even if the military wanted to get involved, military coups require not just motive, they require opportunity. Okay, and the opportunity in the Egyptian case for the military to intervene was provided by liberals and non-Islamists who were calling for military intervention. Right? It was this opportunity for military intervention was provided by a complete breakdown in the in the regular, normal, institutional political process, where you had a segment of the country's political forces who had completely withdrawn from democratic institutions and were calling for these institutions to be brought down. This is the. Uh, the petition, by the way, to bring down the Morsi government that circulated in Egypt prior to his overthrow and by some estimates had several million signatures. Okay. So in Egypt, the non-Islamists were calling for a military coup and that's what helped create the opportunity for that coup. Whereas in, e in uh, Tunisia, the non-Islamists were not calling for any kind of intervention or abrogation of democratic procedures.
Okay? So then the question is, why was there that difference? In Tunisia, yes, the opposition were unhappy with the Islamist dominated government, right? but they were nonetheless negotiating with it in a process that was brokered by the country's largest uh, main labor union, whereas in Egypt, nothing really of that sort was happening. Okay? So the question is, why was that? And again, so now we've shifted from one actor, the military, uh, to another set of actors, which are the political forces in Tunisia and in Egypt. And again, the argument that we often hear is that the people in Tunisia were just somehow better than the Egyptians. You can imagine that me, as a man of Egyptian parentage, dislike this argument a great deal. Um, so uh, the argument is often made, uh, Al Ste uh, Alfred Stepan has argued, for example, that the Tunisians were uh, much more willing to compromise with each other because they had a longer history of compromise going back to the Ben Ali period. Uh, other people have noted, uh, Eva Bellin has made the argument that the Tunisian uh, liberal oppositionists were just more committed to democracy. Uh, it was just more something they just believed in more deeply than their Egyptian uh, counterparts. Others have focused on the Islamists, right? So we often hear about uh, uh, Rashid Ghannouchi, the, the, the uh, head and founder of the Islamist, main Islamist party, Hizb Harakat al-Nahda, the Renaissance party in Tunisia. People point to him as a unique uh, individual who is very moderate, deeply liberal, a deep believer in democracy in ways that his counterparts among the Islamists in Egypt were not, right? So again, the, the focus shifts very uh, uh, definitively to agents and their personal qualities. Um, so the argument uh, we want to make is that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is misleading, right? OK, so you will have an opportunity to destroy this edifice I'm constructing, <laughs> but allow me to construct it. OK, so, so, so the, the point is, uh, so the argument that we basically make, um, and this has been noted by some people, is that what happened in Tunisia, the reason you had more compromise in Tunisia, and the reason that liberal, secularists, and non-Islamists did not want to bring down the entire democratic edifice is because they actually believed that they had a, a shot of winning in the future. Uh, through, the, through the elected process. Whereas in the Egyptian case, the liberals and non-Islamists did not believe that the electoral process would actually deliver to them uh, seats and berths in the uh, legislature and in the government. And the reason that you had these two differing uh, assessments of elections are the fact that the first election in Tunisia actually puts together a fairly pluralistic legislature in which Islamists are the plurality but they are not the majority. So Islamists only have about 41% of the seats in the Tunisian case. The majority is non-Islamist. So if I'm a non-Islamist in Tunisia, why would I want to bring down the, the electoral system? Why would I want to bring down the, the elected government? Uh, I have a chance to win in a future election. Similarly, if I'm an Islamist you know, I, and I want to govern, I have no choice but to compromise because I don't have a majority. And so in fact, when another put together its government, it had to do so in in cooperation with two non-Islamist parties, the CPR and Atteketun. In the Egyptian case, it's totally different. In the Egyptian case, two Islamist parties, the Muslim Brotherhood's political party, the Freedom and Justice Party, and a party from the more extreme Salafi call society called the Party of Light, Hezbollah Nur, they, between them, capture a supermajority in the Egyptian legislature. Okay, And so if you are the Muslim Brotherhood, why should you compromise with these liberals and secularists who are electoral ciphers? They have not at all proven their worth on the Egyptian political landscape. Any rational actor would be at least highly skeptical of the need to compromise with the uh, liberals, right? It's not because the Muslim Brotherhood are extreme or crazy or bad. It's just because they were kind of rational. Um, aboundedly so. Um, so the point is, there is a, there's more pluralism in the Tunisian case than there was in the Egyptian case. In the Tunisian case, they had to compromise. In the Egyptian case, they didn't have to compromise with their uh, political opponents. And that's what creates the rift that allows the military to ram through. And then you could then ask yourself, like, OK, why was it that in the Egyptian case, you had a very lopsided result, and in the Tunisian case, you had a fairly balanced result. And again here, people come to proximate causes. So we often hear 
that the type of electoral system that they picked in Tunisia was really important, right? In Tunisia, they picked proportional list representation with the Hari quota, which uh, is well known to reduce the advantage of large parties. And it's been shown, in fact, that if they had picked a different electoral system in Tunisia, the Islamists would have done a lot better, okay? The problem is that in the Egyptian case, right, you have a, a slightly different electoral system. So two thirds of one third of the seats were actually a Porsche, uh, uh, assigned through a majoritarian system, which we know actually magnifies the advantage of large parties, right? So you could say, well, in the Egyptian case, they had this system that's semi-majoritarian that helps boost the Islamists. The problem is. Two thirds of the seats in Egypt were assigned according to the precise same electoral system that they had in Tunisia. That magical system that's supposed to reduce the advantage of Islamists. And in just those seats, the Islamists still get a supermajority. Okay. So the point is that the Islamists' ability to dominate the political landscape in Egypt was independent of the electoral system. Okay, so the electoral system can't really help us to explain the difference. And as, as Andy already noted, and as we go further into the book, we also believe, look, electoral systems don't determine balances of power. They are reflections of the balance of power. And in the Tunisian case, uh, we uh, do some evidence to that effect. So why was it that in the Tunisian case, there was much more pluralistic than the Egyptian case. And here we have to be a little bit speculative, and we hope this opens up a frontier of research for other scholars, but we think that classic uh, uh, observations of modernization theory are correct, right? That countries that are more economically developed, that are more urbanized and more industrialized, generally tend to produce more complicated and articulated civil societies in which no single group can dominate. And if you just look, for example, at the World Value Survey's uh, latest wave and you look at uh, rates of membership, self-reported membership in different types of organizations for, Indo for Tunisians and Egyptians, the Tunisians are involved in a much richer array and much greater proportions, much richer array of institutions uh, and organizations than their Egyptian counterparts are. And of course, the big one that everybody notes is the labor union. So in the Tunisian case, the general uh, 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 Tunisian labor union is much more powerful and much more politically consequential than its counterpart in the Egyptian case. And that's what you'd expect. The country is more developed. It has a, uh, a higher rate of urbanization. It has a more industrialized labor force. So you'd expect the union to be more important. And that creates a kind of counterweight to uh, Islamists. Um, this is just showing you, for example, the rates of urbanization in Tunisia and Egypt over time to give you a sense of the developmental difference between these two countries. Okay, so let me just sum up here. Um, so as Jason and Andy have noted, existing accounts of the Arab Spring have been pretty voluntaristic. We focus on photogenic actors, uh, you know, daring activists in Tahrir Square holding aloft flags. Um, you know, you, you don't know how much we had to do to make sure that activists holding flags did not get on the cover of our book. It's, and, and in fact, we lost. Um, um, uh, so they focus on that, or they focus when we look at why um, uh, only Tunisia succeeded, they look at the machinations and mistakes of armies and politicians, and we think that this actually diverts attention from the much more important role of structural factors. So, you know, to quote uh, 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 Karl Marx in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, he says, men make their own history, okay, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. And we think this should be, uh, this should be actually one of the blurbs for our book. Um, and we think that these circumstances transmitted from the past determine, as uh, Jason said, whether regimes are cohesive enough to resist uprisings, but it also determines whether there is enough pluralism to society. What Denkart Rustow called this inconclusive political struggle where no side thinks it can dominate and therefore they settle on democracy, right? It's describing Tunisia. Um, the, you know, where, where you have that, uh, is where you're able to sustain democracy. And that is not a function of electoral rules. That's a function of much deeper developmental processes. And so the fact is, and this is why I think the 2011 version of myself was an idiot, uh, we could have predicted the, the pressing trajectories of these Arab Spring cases even before 
this whole thing began. And so just to depress you further, um, you know, so some, some of you almost are, are almost invariably sitting there saying, well, you know, revolutions take time, okay? You guys, you're coming, it's only 2014, give it some time, eventually they're going to get it right. And I guess our point is revolutions don't always take time. And as Jason noted, if we look at the Warsaw Pact countries, uh, and, we look at, and we look just at their Freedom House scores, which we reproduce in the book, within two years, they're all democracies. Right? They all do very well. In other words, for them, revolution didn't really take time. Boom, they made it to democracy very quickly. Not in this not, they did not feature the depressing uh, uh, trajectories of the Arab countries. And you know, one big difference between those Warsaw Pact countries and the Arab countries today is, are these developmental factors. This is from, this is per capita GDP in 2005 constant dollars taken from the Penn World Table. So what we're doing is we're comparing the GDPs per capita of these Eastern European countries in 1990 to uh, Arab non-oil uh, countries uh, today, or 2010, which is when uh, Penn World Table's uh, data is. And, you know, Arab countries a lot poorer than their counterparts in Eastern Europe. This horizontal line represents the magic threshold that political scientists have identified as that threshold at which once you get to democracy, you keep it. That's Argentina in uh, 1976. And even Tunisia, beloved Tunisia, our great uh, example, the savior of Arab democracy is well below that line. So if we had to make a bet, you put a gun to my head and say bet on Tunisia, I'd even say Tunisia's probably not going to last. Okay, with that, uh, thank you all very much. Okay, so we've got uh, a few minutes for oh, you have the mic. Okay, we've got time to do th a round of three questions, and then we'll take a break. We'll have the discussants, and then we'll have a lot more questions. Okay, you're going to be the first question. Will is the second question. Anybody from this section? I'm trying to be pluralist. Okay, yes, uh, you, sir. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, if we take uh, a, a half glass full approach here, unrealistic as that may seem, can you not at least say things like, well, it, uh, uh, the Arab Spring created new political forces that will, over time, in the evolutionary approach you talked about, serve as the foundation for more uh, democratic, more open political systems, uh, A. And B, uh, can the argument not be made that in any event, uh, authoritarian leaders in the region have been given the message that if they continue their authoritarian ways, continue bad governance, lack of accountability, responsiveness, and so on, the day may well come when they uh, would mm -hmm. face what, uh, in those four countries you mentioned, their, predecessors, they, their counterparts faced, and uh, that may not be an ushering in a democracy, but they'll be out of power. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Question, question two from Will. Um, Yes, please. What predictor of events uh, are the educational systems in each of these countries predating the uprising, secular versus uh, religious? Okay. Um, I can tackle the first question. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so the, the first question was, has the... You know, ha things don't look ver very good, but has, have the events of the past few years at least set up the context for improvements over the long term? Maybe they've empowered activists in new ways, 
kind of pushed the boundaries of what people consider possible and also sent a message to autocrats that, um, that their days are numbered. Um, I would say that here the evidence is ambiguous. I mean, we actually, not, we haven't lived up to one part of, of Jeremy's introduction, which is to bring up Iraq, you know? And, and the, Iraq, the Iraq war, the Libya civil war, the Syrian civil war, Yemen's, you know, not collapse, but serious fragmentation, become cautionary tales for activists. And in some ways, they can reinforce an autocrat's argument that I'm better than the alternative. Andy, did you want to say anything? No, I mean, just on this first question. Um, it, yeah, it's, so, so if you read some of the literature about the, the, the 1848, mid-19th century spread, um, so Eric Hobsbawm says that, obviously, most of those revolutions in Western Europe failed fairly <coughs> quickly. After much like the Arab Spring, the the the, the, the new ra the new Democrats, the, the 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 people trying to overthrow monarchies, um, actually were ousted, and Ashram regime types came back very quickly. But Hobsbawm argues that just as you said or implied, there's a sowing of the seeds of a new type of politics, in that it laid the groundwork that played out then over decades and centuries of new movements, whether they be union movements or activist movements, civil society movements, being emboldened from that first experience to actually develop to a point where the democracy was very slowly established in, in Western Europe over time. And whilst those spring revolutions failed initially, they did change the mindset, the discourse in the future. So again, as Jason says, I mean, I think it's way uh, too early for us to take a reading on that in the Arab world, but precedent says that whatever happens, and it may take centuries, the mindset has been altered. And I would even point more strongly to education, almost over-education, coupled with under an unemployment. So that's not a trend that's going away. The youth bulge, the education, the connectedness of Arab youth, connected and combined with their lack of access to good jobs and fulfilling roles in society, is something that's an insidious tumor at the center of society that's not going away. And so these authoritarian regimes will have to con continue to keep the lid on the pressure cooker even more strenuously over the next decades and, and, and centuries. Great. Um, I, I'll just uh, try to respond uh, very quickly. Um, so the first question was, you know, authoritarians have been given this message that perhaps, um, but let's look at what's happened uh, throughout the Arab world since the uh, Arab Spring. I think the message uh, that uh, authoritarians may have gotten is that it turns out that we weren't so bad. And so look at Tunisia in the recent election, which qualifies as Tunisia's actually consolidation of democracy because it meets the two turnover tests. The party that gets the plurality is Nidat Tunis, which has a huge representation, huge component of that party is made up of the former RCD, the former ruling party. So maybe this is, we really are in a kind of Brumarian mode where people are, are turning back to the old autocrat. In Egypt, I'll note that Abdel Fattah Hassisi, the, the man who rules Egypt now, was elected with 96% of the vote. Now, very few people went out to vote for him, etc. But the point is his face is also on cupcakes. I mean, people have this, seem to have this uh, yearning for a return to the old authoritarian stability. So I'm not sure that the message they've gotten is we need to be representative and accountable or else. Um, the uh, question about educational systems is a very important question. I think as Andy has noted, one of the drivers of protests seem to have been a mismatch between people's level of education and their level of opportunity. Um, education also figures in another way in that, as we know, going back to Seymour Martin Lipset, we tend to find that more educated societies tend to be ones that are more able to sustain democracy. And I'd note Tunisia actually has a much higher literacy rate than Egypt. Tunisia is about 80%, Egypt's about 70%. Um, and I think when the, the final definitive history of the Arab Spring has been written, people are going to look at the education policies of the Tunisian autocratic state 
um, and we'll find some of the seeds of uh, that country's uh, greater success uh, there. Uh, Will's question about uh, popular support for the Brotherhood, I, 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 uh, this is an important question. I, I wrote a, a book about it. Um, I think basically the, so the argument that uh, I, I've tried to make elsewhere and that I think is consistent with the argument in this book is that Egyptians were never kind of homo Islamicus, always ready to give a majority to Islamists, that they, they, they voted for Islamists because they thought Islamists were going to do better on certain concrete things. And when Islamists didn't, that's when they defected from them. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there because Jason told me to be succinct. <laughs> So we can have some more coffee. Uh, so let's take uh, a break and, until a quarter till, and then we'll reconvene. Okay, thank you.